again. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we are not, make us. Lead us right now to hear and cause us to be open to your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The great composer, uh, Franz Liszt, uh, first gained fame throughout the world, really, as a pianist. He was just widely known for his great skill. Before he became the famous composer, um, he was playing the piano, widely acknowledged as the best, the finest pianist of the 19th century. And they say that his clever wife used to get out of bed before him and start breakfast and to get him out of bed in the morning, um, she would go to the piano downstairs, he was up, and and play the first seven notes of a scale on the downstairs piano. You know, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Susan, I've asked her to play it for us because I know you didn't recognize it. <laughs> and poor, poor Franz is there laying in bed and he hears that and he just can't stand it, you know? And, and, and she, she just stopped, go right back to her cooking. He just could do it again, Susan, thank you. She's doing it now because she knows it bothers me, okay? <laughs> um, but no, thank you for doing that. And, and uh, so he would invariably, you know, get frustrated. He would get up and throw his robe on and go downstairs and walk over the piano and hit that last note. Susan, can you run back up there and hit it for us? <laughs> we got to have it now. <laughs> Thank you! Hey, it's complete. Now, by then his breakfast would be ready. Now, there's something in all of us that longs for resolution, for completion, for things to, to be made right. We cannot abide the unfinished work. If you don't believe me, try singing that grand hymn we did just a few minutes ago, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. You know? Uh, I'm going to try another. I'm going to sing again. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. No ya. Yeah. Try it again. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. I mean, it kind of hurts, doesn't it? I don't like it any more than you do. Uh, but I like seeing you suffer, so that's why we did it two times. Well, you just want to put the final note on it, right? I mean, we want to, we want to see it resolve. We want to see it come to completion. The Gospel of Mark is kind of like that. <laughs> You're going, how is it like that? Well, the way it tells the Easter story, Mark 16, the, the eight, eight verses that make up that chapter, you see, the, the writer of the Gospel of Mark ends the book... Uh, very much like a sentence that never... <laughs> and that's kind of the way it goes. You read the... Mark left off the ending so that just like Franz Liszt, you and I would have to get up on an Easter Sunday morning and finish the story. You'll see what I mean when we read it, What you're going to do right now. Mark 16, it goes like this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene... Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on the way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe. It was an angel. They didn't know it. Sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. <laughs> and on that weak note, Mark ends the gospel story. It's not how we would expect it to end. It's not how we would write it ourselves probably. But from the empty tomb, Mark says these women, they run trembling. They're afraid. And they said nothing to anybody because of their fear. 
They don't run to the risen Christ. They don't drop and to uh, hold him. There are no resurrection appearances in Mark, no organ music, no hallelujahs. Nobody shouts, he is risen indeed. Folks, let me tell you something. This is no way to celebrate a resurrection. But it's exactly the way that Mark writes it. I mean, this can't be the way that it ends. So I want everybody to turn to your neighbor and say that. This can't be the way it ends. Yeah, I mean, it just can't be, right? It's, it can't be the way it is. Second generation of Christians, they were so bothered by this, this uh, ending, this not much of an ending to the gospel, that they wrote not one, but two separate endings to the gospel of Mark, and they were added by later editors. Modern translations do not include them, of course, and for very good reason. They were not a part of the original. And so they've been dropped. The Gospel of Mark, as written, leaves you suspended with a kind of an open-ended conclusion, which really concludes nothing at all, and he did it on purpose. You see, uh, Mark left off that ending so that just like Litz, we would have to do the same thing, get out of bed, tumble downstairs, you know, uh, walk over to the piano, play that, and finish the story hit the note, make it conclude. If these women are not going to tell anybody about the risen Christ, uh, somebody's going to have to do it. And that somebody, Mark might say with a little bit of a wink, is you. You're the one that needs to do it. So there are three features of this story that I want to point out real quickly. Um, there's a challenge for your mind. There's grace for your soul. And there's a mission for your life. We'll start off and we'll see the challenge for your mind. You know, all four of the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them tell about the women coming to Jesus' tomb on Easter Sunday. All of them do. What's unique about Mark's account is he specifically mentions these certain women by name. Three times. Three women. He mentions them three times in the span of nine short verses. End of chapter 15 uh, through chapter 16. So Mark is very careful to record with striking repetitiveness the names that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome were the first witnesses to the tomb. Now why does Mark write like this? Historians say that in ancient times, writers would often let you know um, with clues like this that what they were writing was historical. He's saying the names three times. It's easy to write off the biblical accounts like this. Jesus resurrection. It's got to be legend, you know. It's a nice story and all, but there's no way dead people, you know, come back from the grave. But here, here's the thing about that. In the decades after Jesus' death, there were dozens of movements uh, of, of, uh, in Israel, decades before, rather, of Je before Jesus' death, uh, dozens of movements with would-be messiahs. And every time... They were killed, and the movement itself would collapse, and that was it. Everybody just go home. But when Jesus was killed, his movement did not collapse. It exploded in growth to the point that 200 years later, the Christian movement filled the Roman Empire and has since become the single largest faith group in the world by a significant margin. How do you account for that? Well, the church's answer is simple. The third day after he was killed, Jesus rose from the grave bodily. And he appeared to, to many of his friends, repeatedly to his friends. And of course, skeptical people are going to insist, and I understand. And if that's you today, by the way, we're glad you're here. And, and uh, we really are not bothered if you want to disagree with us. We'd love for you to believe. Uh, but if you don't, um, you know, start where you are. But some people say there's just got to be an explanation, right? Uh, we may not know why the Jesus movement exploded with growth the way it did, but one thing we do know, it wasn't because a dead Jew came back to life, because that doesn't happen. Well, here's where Mark gives you the challenge for your mind. Real challenge. Because in naming these three women repeatedly, he's taking pains to point out that they are living witnesses to the empty tomb, the two Marys and Salome. Uh, they would have still been alive at the time that Mark's gospel starts to be circulated through the Roman Empire. Uh, throughout uh, 
the area around Jerusalem. So Mark's essentially saying, hey, you don't have to believe me. Go find these three women. They'll, they'll tell you the truth. They can corroborate what, I'm, what I've written. And not only that, if he had been trying to create credible sounding but fake news about uh, an empty tomb, Mark would have never made up a story about women being the witnesses. And here's why. In that society, and I know it sounds awful, but in that society, the testimony of women was unreliable. They considered it irrelevant. A woman witness to an event was no witness to an event. And that was the way they viewed it. So what's that mean? Well, what it means is that the only motive that Mark could have possibly had for putting women there and emphasizing it over and over and over was honesty. That was his motive. He's saying this is what really happened. He's committed to telling them the events as they were. Mark's account does not read like legendary accounts from that day. It just doesn't. Uh, it reads like history. And you might say, well, it's all good. You know, it's great, Randy. Appreciate that. But, you know, back then people were inclined to believe of stuff like this a whole lot more than we are today. I mean, you know, they believed in supernatural miracles, resurrection, but today we know better. Well, I think Mark wants to challenge your intellect on that one as well. I mean, Jesus repeatedly told his 12 closest followers, his 12 closest friends, I'm going to die, and on the third day I'm going to be raised. He told them over and over. It didn't sink in. And on that Easter Sunday morning, not a single man went to the tomb to look, to see if, hey, maybe it came true. The women went, but what did they do? They brought burial spices. Uh, you know, nobody was expecting a resurrection. Nobody was. You think these women showed up at the graveyard that Sunday morning for an Easter sunrise service? I don't think so. I mean, they, they, they showed up there at the place of the dead looking for a dead man. No, the resurrection was just as unthinkable to them. And frankly, they were around death a whole lot more than any of us uh, are ever around death. But over and over, people died really young back then. It was unthinkable. And so Mark issues this challenge to your mind that I believe every educated, thinking person really ought to investigate. And yet he doesn't just aim for your mind. He, he aims for your heart. There's a grace for your heart. Listen again to the message uh, that Jesus has the angel of the young man there at the tomb conveyed to the women. Verse 7, he says, Now go and tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee. You'll see him there just as he told you before he died. Now what's amazing to me in this, and I know it's Jesus and all, well, what's amazing, you know, is that he doesn't say, go and tell that band of faithless cowards to come find me, and maybe if they really grovel, I might just forgive and reinstate these backstabbers. He didn't say that. He knew all along what they were going to do. He knew all along that they were going to fold when it got really tough. He knew that. Before he was even crucified. He's, but then he says to them, even after I'm raised from the dead, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. I will meet you there. That's what he's telling them. We'll be there together. In other words, the message is no matter how badly you've messed up, no matter how far you've slid, I want you to follow me and be a part of my mission, be a part of my family. So Jesus offers a grace of the heart, this reassuring word of forgiveness and restoration to these disciples despite their backstabbing ways and their abandoning him. But there's an even greater word of grace here. I know you saw it. Two words, right? And Peter. Did you see those? Yeah. All the disciples abandoned Jesus. But Peter took it to another level. I mean, Peter, he really did. He, he denied Jesus when he was on Peter. He swore up and down that he didn't even know who Jesus was. Did you know in Mark's gospel, Peter's name hasn't even been mentioned since that event until it's mentioned right here. Hadn't even been mentioned. But here the angel wants to make really clear. He says, go tell the disciples and Peter. If the message had been, you know, just to the disciples in general, 
You could imagine Peter saying, oh, man, you know, uh, you guys go ahead. I, I, don't, I, don't think I, I don't think I should go after what I've done. But with two grace-filled words, and Peter, you know, Jesus changes all that. In spite of these catastrophic denials, Peter is not beyond saving. Jesus is saying to him, and Jesus is saying to you this morning, my death on the cross and resurrection from the dead have purchased your forgiveness, and I want you back. That's what he's telling you. That's exactly what he's saying to you this morning. I, I want you back. But yeah, but you don't know what I've done. You don't, you don't know how low I've sunk. You don't know how far I wandered from God. And you're right, I have no idea. But Jesus knows. And your story isn't over yet, no matter how it looks to you. Yes, you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Welcome to the human race. I'm one too. We're all that. But the Easter message of grace is that you have that Savior. And he's offering you a way home. So the word to you... This Easter Sunday is the same word as, the, as was delivered to Peter. I want you back. No matter how great your failure, I haven't given up on you. I died for you, and I have loving plans for you, including you, especially you. I have plans. Mark offers a challenge to intellect, grace for your heart, and then the truth uh, that leads to this. He offers a mission for your life. He offers a me. I, I can't tell you how many people I talk with, um, and not just young adults, who feel like life's empty. And people of all ages, life, they feel like it's empty. And it's hard to understand because we fill our lives with so much. We're so busy. How can we ever be empty? You know, and we fill our lives with something, right? But just because our lives are filled with stuff does not mean that the emptiness does not linger. That the question doesn't remain and haunt us every day. Is this, is this really all there is? You know, work 70 hours a week? Pay for this home over 30 years or even more stressful? Get a bigger home, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, drive cars, go on vacation. I mean, it's fun, but is this really all there is? Is life ultimately pointless? Because I'm telling you, if that's all there is, it is pointless. I mean, it's got no meaning. Somebody tell me there is a reason, that there's a grand design, that there's a purpose in life. Is there somebody that will not only fulfill me, but somebody who is also true in the deepest sense of, word, of the word and give me a purpose, you know, Logic almost demands a purpose. You see it from so many angles. I'll offer you just one. I, I found the question curious uh, often, and maybe you will too. Why eyebrows and fingernails should have a purpose, but the purpose who, the person who possesses them does not. I mean, isn't that kind of curious to you? I and mean, it doesn't strike you as, oh, man, that doesn't sound quite right, you know? I mean, literally every cell in the human body serves something bigger than itself, but the whole person is left only to serve himself or herself? Let me tell you something. You do have a purpose. There is a God, and he has, a, he has something for you, a higher power than you, created you, loves you, has a reason for your existence. And he wants you to see it. Mark's gospel tells us that it is in honoring and serving and obeying Jesus. That that really is the purpose for a human being. To honor and serve and, and love Jesus. Uh, this creator who has come to reclaim us. Saying, I want you back. We got away. And he's come back to take us back. The, the humble one who, who offered himself on the cross, he's the one who designed you. So he's the one who knows what you need. He knows what you run on. And until you are filled with him, you'll always have that nagging emptiness. You might be able to medicate it away for brief periods of time with all sorts of things and not just drugs and alcohol. 
clothes and cars and homes and career, and even your spouse. But until you're filled with him, it's going to be that emptiness. Let me tell you something, friends. This, this can't be the way it is. I mean, this just can't be the way it is. <laughs> you know, at the 2016 Golden Globe Awards, Jim Carrey, I think, is a uh, you know, really funny guy. He takes the stage to introduce the nominees for the best motion picture, um, the comedy, and, and his speech was uh, less an introduction, really. Uh, in fact, it was an introduction into the inner searches of his soul. And he's, he's being funny, but it, it got kind of serious at one point. It's, it was this personal introduction, and it quickly turned into this painfully honest critique of his own search for meaning. So after being introduced as two-time Golden Globe uh, winner Jim Carrey, he proceeded with a crack, you know, his, you know, a couple of self-aggrandizing jokes about what it's like to be a, a two-time award winner. Carrey said, thank you, thank you, everybody's applauding, you know, thank you, I am two-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey. And when I go to sleep at night, I'm not just a guy going to sleep. I'm two-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey going home for some needed shut-eye. And when I dream, I don't just dream any old dream, you know. I dream about being three-time Golden Globe winning actor uh, Jim Carrey because then I would be enough. Then I would finally be true. And then I could finally stop this terrible search for what I know ultimately will not fill me. Everybody laughed, but it was awkward at the same time. And with nearly nine million views, they're still laughing because he's a funny guy. But the source of the humor is in the truth that it partially conceals. He was joking about the absurdity of trying to find ultimate fulfillment and meaning in anything not named Jesus. There's a challenge for your mind. There's a grace for your heart. There's a mission for your life. And you could, you know, go home just the same way you arrived. But I want to encourage you, write a few more verses for the end of Mark. and Put your name in there. There's one thing I'm convinced of. This can't be the way it ends. Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. You've given your son to die on the cross for us. You've offered us a way where there was no way. You brought your son back from the dead so that we might have victory in life and in death. I just pray, Father, that every person here who's heard this challenge, open to your Holy Spirit, might respond to it. Father, let your word seep into our hearts, those hidden places in our souls that we don't tell anybody about. And touch us and heal us and draw us, O oh God, inexorably toward yourself for your glory in the name of your son amen <clears throat>